14, we'll read verses 1 through 6 tonight. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Tonight I want to talk to you about the way that ye know. The way ye know. You'll see where I got that title. John 14, 1 through 6. We'll read that. one of those times where I'm about ready to die again. Your eyes clear up and all that. And you start to see better. And start feeling good. And you have a really good burrito too? Yeah, I had a really good burrito. The best okay. burrito I've ever ate in my life. And I uh, had a big stroke tonight. Wake up dead in the morning. I think I can see. I, I, could, I didn't need my glasses this morning. Did you notice that when I preached this morning? Didn't even use my glasses. But I don't know. I have no clue. Can't see quite as good tonight as I could this morning. But it says in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way... Ye know. That's my title tonight. The way ye know. And so, uh, verse 5 says, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful. Lord, pray that you bless us. Give us a great time in your word tonight. A little simple message tonight to help us to realize that the way we know. And uh, Lord, we don't have to worry. We don't have to. We can even look forward to your coming uh, with expectation. We can even look forward to going to heaven with expectation. And, and, and desire that time to come. Because we know the way. And so Lord, I pray that you help us uh, to be strong. Help us, Lord, to have a, uh, an ability, Lord, to even compel others, Lord, to want to know the way. Because, again, the way we know, ye know. And so, Lord, we're thankful. Bless us now. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have met very few people who, when talking about heaven, are eager to go. Uh, they, they talk about heaven, and they, they look forward to it, I guess, in some ways, but they're not eager to go. And truth be known, probably most would be apprehensive about going to heaven. And why is that? Well, when it comes to heaven, we don't have, uh, we don't have the advantage uh, to make a few visits and, and to set our mind to these. We don't know exactly what lays before us. We don't know exactly what's out there. But yes, we do. You know, we, we, we say to ourselves, we've never been there, we don't know. But yes, we do know. And, and so we need to understand that. And, and aren't you glad that Thomas asked the question, he had the guts to ask the question that he asked in our text tonight. Look at verse 5 again. It says, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And he was telling them that you know where I'm going and you know the way. And he came back, to, uh, Thomas came back and said, but we don't know. And he, he was telling Thomas, yes, you do know, you see. And so when we read that verse again, it says, Thomas said to them, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And of course, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now this isn't, that verse, in verse 5, is not just talking about direction. Look at what Jesus said in verse 4. Verse 4 it says, And whither I go, ye know, and the way, Ye know. And so, so he's talking to him and saying, you know, uh, whither I go, you know the place. You don't, I'm not just saying you know how to get there. I'm saying you know what's there when I get there, is what he's saying. It says it again, look what it says, verse 4. And whither I go, ye know. You know the place that I'm going. You know all about it, is what he's saying to them. And he says, also he says to him, and the way ye know. So it's not just how to get there. 
He's talking about, you know the place. You know where I'm going and you know what it's all about. You know what's there, you see. And so as I said, what Jesus is saying there is it's not just a direction. Now here's a question. Why are there so few people who seem eager about heaven and the opportunity to go there? Now, Dr. Rockman, undoubtedly one of the greatest, and let me say that at the camera, one of the greatest Bible teachers ever. I mean, I'm not a man follower. I mean, I'm not. I'm not a man follower. You guys aren't either. You're not a man follower. You follow your Bible. But if you find a man who can teach the Bible and who can show you things and, and uh, that go right with the Bible and say, here's why the Bible says this, and he takes you to another verse, and you go, man, I never saw that before. You know, that's a good Bible teacher. That's somebody who has been well read in their Bible. And what he is, is he's his own concordance. You know, he's read the Bible enough to where he can, he can say, you know why that says that right there? Because, and he takes you back to the Old Testament, or takes you to another portion or scripture of the Bible, that you say, man, I never correlated that together before. But that makes sense, and that's what Christ was trying to do, you see. That's why he's a good Bible teacher. And that's, I, I'm not a man follower, but if a man can teach the Bible and can show me th some things, man, I'll, I'll hold on. I'll, I'll listen to what he says. Amen? So what a blessing that is. And, and why is that that he can do that? Because he knows his Bible. Amen. So we just need to get ourselves in the know. Because, again, my title is The Way Ye Know. And that doesn't mean, can I say it again, not just how to get there. Not just how to get to heaven. But you know what's there when you get there. Amen. You know the place. You see and so I want to show us some things. Let's, let's follow the order of Christ tonight in, uh, in verse 4. And uh, he can, he's going to show us some things. He's going to show us why we know the way. The way he know. Even though Thomas said, but we don't know. And Christ says, but you do. And we're, the, we're in the same boat, so to speak. So look at, uh, we'll follow that same order in verse 4. And look at verse 4 again. It says, and whither I go... Ye know. So he said, whither I go, ye know. And that's the promise of God. In our text, Jesus gives his disciples, and what he's doing is giving them a picture of heaven. You see. It's a, look at verse, back to verse 2. It's a prepared place. Verse 2 says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So you should be excited to go to heaven when you know that Christ has prepared a place for us. Amen? It's a prepared place. Now, I'm not going to go into all the particulars, but if you read your Bible, uh, turn to uh, Revelation chapter 21. We've been in Revelation quite a bit. But look at uh, Revelation chapter 21. We're going a little bit farther than what we, we usually center pretty well on, on uh, chapters 19 and 20 because it talks about the uh, uh, coming back and ruling and reigning with Christ. And when Christ comes back and sets up the millennial reign and uh, talks about the, uh, uh, the great white throne judgment uh, at the end of that millennial reign, and it talks about going into the eternal state, uh, that's in chapter 20. And then look at, verse, uh, uh, look at chapter 21. And this tells us about the eternal state. This tells us about once we, once we go to heaven, that what's going to happen is Jerusalem's going to come down. And uh, there's going to be a time when this earth goes into an eternal state that what's going to happen is this earth is going to, or heaven is going to come down to earth. There'll be no more, no more like a, 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 a separation between heaven and the earth. You see. Uh, where do you get that from? Well, look at, uh, look at Revelation chapter 21. And look at verse 1. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And it says, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw it. Now, now, do you know what that means? Now, a lot of people would say, wait a minute. What do you mean there's no more sea? Does that mean like the Pacific and the Atlantic? Uh, they, what do they do, evaporate at all? You know, that's probably what the, uh, what the uh, 
um, tree huggers would say, see what's happened. We populated the earth so much that what has to happen is the earth, uh, these seas have to dry up to make room for all these people that we overpopulated the earth with. That's not what it's talking about at all. It says, it says, look what it says again. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, for the first heaven and the uh, first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, is that talking about the Atlantic and the Pacific? Does anybody know? No, it's not. It's talking about the great sea that separated heaven from earth. It separated the third heaven where God was. And so it's talking about that crystal sea, you see. And, and that's, that is no more between heaven and earth, you see. I shouldn't say it that way, but amen. And it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, ah, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that, uh, that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Then look at, uh, skip over to uh, uh, verse 10. Verse 10. Verse 10 says, gives a little bit more description. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light out, uh, her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like jasper stone clear as crystal, and had a great wall and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and then the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and the measure of the city with a reed 12,000 furlongs, giving us all the, the size and all that. He's given us great descriptions. You can read all the way through those verses. And he gives us a description, a picture of what heaven's going to be like when it comes down here to earth. And one day it will be just like it began. What do you mean by that? Well, did you notice there's a lot of things there that say you go back to the beginning uh, of chapter 21. And, and you go back there and a lot of this stuff is very similar to where it talks about how God will walk with us. Says It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Now, did you know that you go back to Genesis chapter 2, and there was a time when God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, it says. And so what I'm getting at is there's going to be a lot of things that you should, should uh, put a light bulb up in your mind and say, Man, there's a lot of those things that God is mentioning here that what heaven will be like was a lot like how the Garden of Eden was in the beginning before sin came into the world. It's the way it is. That's, what's, that's what we got to look forward to in heaven, you see. And so do you see why Christ was saying to them, to his disciples, to his apostles there, that he said, whither I go, ye know. And what we need to know is it will be a perfect place. I think I mentioned this before, but the great preacher R.G. Lee said about heaven, he, made, he said this quote, It is the most beautiful place the mind of God can, could conceive and the hand of God could create. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I'd love somebody to, I'd love to be able to say some quotes like that that will be remembered. You see. Again, Arjun Lee said, It is the most beautiful place that the mind of God could conceive and the hand of God could create. And, and also, which would put a person's mind at ease 
what should put our mind at ease about heaven would be the certainty of the pathway of how to get there. So, so just as what Christ said, he said, whither I go, ye know. I, I'm not talking, he said, I, and, and I'm going to say this again, I want you to understand this, that when Christ is saying that, he's not saying you just know how to get there. He's saying you know the place when you get there, you know where I'm going. You know all about it if you're into my word, you see. But he also says, uh, look at that, look at that verse 4, and whither I go, ye know, and ye know the way. He's saying, you know the pathway. You know how to get there. And the pathway to heaven is certain. Look what Christ told Thomas, again in verse 4, and the way ye know, he's saying, you know how to get there. You know the path. First of all, look at verse 6. Look what verse 6 says. Jesus saith unto him. So he's telling him, you know exactly how to get there. You know the way. See, he was telling his disciples that what's going to happen is, and they're not quite in full understanding of what's going to happen yet, but they will be. By the time uh, Christ goes to the cross and Christ resurrects, they understand what they got to do. They understand the path. And we have, we have the... Uh, the blessing, the uh, now the the uh, hindsight to look back and say, man, we we had it made when it comes to uh, knowing how to go to heaven because we got God's word. We get to see exactly what Christ was showing the disciples and why He was telling them that. We have the uh, the uh, the benefit of hindsight. You see, then we get to see that that He came. And, and of course, he came as a king. That was my uh, my message this morning. That yes, he came came as a king, but he came much more than just a king. And he would have been satisfied to come and be just the king had they accepted him. But what happened is they rejected him. You see. And so what happened is he, he came as our savior, the Gentile. And so when we look at this, again, you look at verse 6. He says, there's only one way to get there, and you know it. And so can I say, again, my title tonight is the way he know. You not only know what's there, but you know how to get there. Look at verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, I say that uh, many times Christine was down there at uh, street preaching with me this past Friday, and uh, she could probably tell you just about how many times I used that verse. I bet you I used that verse five, six, seven times while I was down there on the street corner. As I always say, you know, Christ himself said, because there's a lot of people out there that say, I believe there's more than one way to heaven. A lot of people say, I think I can get to heaven because I'm a good person. Now, can I... Can I bore you again by telling you some of the things that I tell them down there? I'll say, you can't get there by being a good person, being a good parent, being good to your pets, being good to your grandparents. You can't be good, uh, get to heaven by being a good grandparent or a good parent. Uh, you can't get to heaven by, uh, by eating purple popsicle sticks. The only way you can get there is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then I'll say something like, Jesus Christ himself said in the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This morning I said that a lot of people will say, well, I believe in God, and I believe in the Bible, but I struggle believing in Jesus Christ. Now, I struggle believing that a man can get me to heaven. And then what I want to say to them is, then you don't know your Bible. Because the Bible says, if you say that you believe in God and you believe in the Bible, then you need to read the Bible. Because the Bible says in John 5, 39, certain the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. That's Christ talking. And the Bible also says right here in this verse that we're at, John 14, 6, Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So that's the only way you can get to heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what Christ was telling them. And again, back in verse 4, he says, And whither I go, ye know, so you know the place. And not only do you know the place, but you know how to get there. And then he tells them, remember, 
I am the way, the truth, life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see. So you can only get there one way. Don't let your uncertainty of heaven be on account that you trusted some other work than the blood of Jesus Christ. There's been times before that I preached out of the Old Testament. And I've taken people back to Exodus chapter 12. And I love the, I love uh, the, the, uh, just the, uh, the, the, the picture of Exodus chapter 12. When God is telling them to, uh, that I'm about ready to, uh, to set you free out of Egypt. And he says, go fetch yourselves lambs. And I'm going to do something tonight that you're going to uh, put in the history books. And you're going to teach your kids. And you're going to teach your kids to teach their kids. And their kids, their kids. And you're going to remember this forever. And he says, go get a lamb. And sacrifice that lamb. And take that blood. And put it on the doorposts. And he said, what will happen is, because he said, I'm, I'm about to do a mighty work here in Egypt that's going to convince Egypt that they are to let you go. You know what I'm talking about. It's when God sent the death angel. And it took all the four, firstborn of all of Egypt, animals and humans, and took all their, all their firstborn and they died. Even the king of Egypt, the pharaoh of Egypt, his firstborn son died that night. And he told, he told uh, Israel, he said, now if you guys will go and get this blood and sacrifice a perfect lamb and take that blood and put it on the doorposts of your door of your house. He said, when that death, death angel comes over your house, it'll pass over. It won't come into that house and kill the firstborn, you see. And what it was is, and of course, you know what that's a picture of. It's a, it's a picture of the, the perfect Savior that was to come. That, that what will get the death angel to pass over us, that second death that we have to experience if we're not saved, will be the blood of Jesus Christ. You see. And so just as what Christ was telling them, the pathway to heaven, you know it, and it is certain. He says again there in that verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Secondly, get used to the fact that we can only enter heaven one of two ways. And that is either through death or through the rapture. It's the only way it's going to happen for us. It's an exciting thing to think about. Now death, I know a lot of people don't uh, think death is a comfortable thing to talk about. The only people that I see that get comfortable with the thought of death is those who get saved and know the way. Amen. Have you ever talked to somebody? If, if you know some saved people and some good old saints, and what will happen is uh, they might get down into their, their years to where they might have only a month to live, and they'll say, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready. And the reason they can have that, that kind of uh, assurance uh, on their deathbed is because of their Savior. Amen. Listen to what God says about death for the saint. Psalm 23, 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 48, 14 says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide, even unto death. You see. What a blessing it is. Amen. That when you get saved, you can have the assurance. Just like he said there, and whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. So you're either going to go by death, or you're going to be caught up out of this world. And of course, we've talked about that a lot. We don't even have to go there when we talk about the rapture and how the rapture works. Someday you'll hear the trump of God. Possibly. I mean, that it's for sure going to happen. The only uncertainty is, will we be here when it happens? Because we don't know the time. You know, it might be another 50 years. It might be tomorrow. It might be tonight. It could be another 100 years from now. 
I mean, even, even uh, Micaiah might be, you know, gone by the way of death before. He's the youngest one here, I believe. He might be, shut up, Christian. He's going, oh, I'm the youngest. So what I'm saying is, is uh, we don't know. It's, but we know one of two things. It's going to be one or the other. We're either going to be called out of here by death or called out of here by the trump of God and caught up. And then finally, quick little message tonight. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye, there ye may be also. Isn't that something? I would not stop right there about probably, well, I guess it's either way, either death or through the rapture. He says he's coming. Amen. And so, so finally, what we're looking at there is the anticipation of the presence of God. That someday what's going to happen is we're going to be with God for eternity. What a blessing that will be. Here's my last verse tonight, and we'll close. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. You know what that means? That means when we, when God is, of course we have the Holy Spirit with us, so we have His presence with us, but, but man, what's it going to be like when this earth is perfect and we don't have the pull of sin on us? We don't have the pull of Satan. We don't have the temptations of Satan. What's it going to be like? Man, will that be something. That verse again says, Psalm 1611, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing it is. What an assurance we have. And so at closing tonight, what I want to say is, you know what? You don't have to fret. Because what Christ tells us is the way you know. Now, if you're here tonight and you don't know, then why not do what Christ says? When he says there in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why not get that settled and get that right tonight? If you're here tonight and you don't know that you're saved, then that's the way. That's the way to go right there. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. I tell a lot of people down on the street corner, I said, this is what you got to do. I said, there's three simple things that we have to know. Number one, we're all sinners. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Now, do you know we're not down there getting in people's faces? We're down there to show them that, you know, we're just like you are. I'll say for all of us, and I said, what that does is that puts us all in the same boat. And I'll say something like this to them. We're not here to make fun of you. We're here to tell you we're just like you are. The only difference is, is we, we know what the Bible says about how to get saved. And we're down here to tell you how to get saved. And so I say the first thing that you need to realize is that we're all sinners. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God, we all come short of being able to go be with God in eternity. There's nothing that we can do of our own accord that will get us to heaven. God says all our filthinesses, or all our righteousnesses, are as filthy rags. You can't save yourself. Too many people out there say, well, I, I think I'm a good person. I think I'm a good grandma. I mean, I even hold my grandchild in services. So I think that right there, when God sees the, the love that I have for this boy, I think that, you know, even if I wasn't saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, I think that God would let me into heaven when he sees the love that I have for my grandchildren. Now, I, I don't believe that Christine thinks that way, but I believe there's a lot of people out there who do. Amen? Don't you? Sure are. A lot of people out there that think, well, I'm a good person. I'm good to my grandparents. I, I, my grandchildren, I do good things for them. That ain't going to get you to heaven. You see, all our righteousnesses, that's a righteousness. That's, when, that's something that you said that I'm good at, that I, that I think God will respect me for. He says all those things are as filthy rags. Those won't get you to heaven. They're good things. There's nothing wrong with them. 
But there's something wrong with them if you're trying to use them to get yourself to heaven, because that won't work. Especially when he says, there's something in this Bible that you need to know. That, that not only are we sinners, but the Bible also says because of our sin, we have a sin wage to pay. And so having a love for your grandchildren or being a good person, that will not pay your sin wage. It's a good thing. Nothing wrong with having it, having that trait, but it won't pay your sin wage. God says there's the, the, that, that because we're sinners, we have a sin wage to pay. And I say, now here's the good news. The good news is just like what Christ said. He says again in that verse, I am the way, the truth, life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Christ, did you know that God says that same thing? In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God commends His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What that means is that Christ went to that cross to pay our sin wage. Amen. That's how simple that is. And so when Christ sits here and tells His disciples, and tells you as a disciple, if you're following Him and you have trusted in His blood, He's saying, you know the way. You already put your faith in my blood. You're already covered with my blood. When God looks at you, he sees nothing but my blood, and, and, and uh, my blood has cleansed you from your sin. That was going to send you straight to hell. You see, that's how simple it is. That's how simple it is to get saved. And so what I challenge you with tonight is to, again, say, you know the way. And if you did it before, you know it now. Because you just heard what the Bible said. So if you're sitting here tonight and, and you say, I, I guess I didn't know the way, then make it right. Get right. Accept that gift that God has given. A lot of people say, well, I believe in God. That's not enough. God says the blood of Jesus Christ was a sacrifice gift to save us. And so what I challenge you to do is accept that gift. How do I do that? The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so what you need to do is call upon the name of the Lord. Something like this. God, I know that I am a sinner now. I know that there's nothing that I can do. There's no good work that I can do that can get me to heaven. But what I understand now is that the blood of Jesus Christ will save me from my sin. And so God, I'm calling on him to save me. I'm calling on that blood to cleanse me. And I'm making that offering, so to speak, and saying, God, here it is. I'm putting all my trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's kind of what it, what it is to call on the Lord Jesus Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how simple it is. Father, we're thankful, Lord, I pray that you help us. Maybe there's someone here tonight, Lord, who wants to respond. Whether it be uh, in an encouragement to say, yep, I know the way and I'm thankful. And I'm coming to the altar to basically give testimony and praise the Lord for what he's done for me. Or maybe there's some tonight, or there might be someone tonight who is not saved. Who is, has not known the way, but now through the Bible has understood what they need to do. The night challenge is tonight to come. Come to this altar and get saved. Ask the Lord to save you. Realize that it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Realize just what Christ said there in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, that you cannot get to heaven if you have not come by way of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through that blood that he sacrificed on the cross. Then I challenge you. Come tonight with that offering. And offer it up to God. And tell God I want to be saved. I want to be cleansed from my sin. Why not come tonight?